Good evening, everyone, and thanks a lot for joining me. Um, I'm sitting here in a rainy Johannesburg on day five of complete lockdown. Um, unlike most of you guys, we don't even get out to exercise. It's great fun. So plenty of academic exercise going on. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, it's yeah, as I say, it's the most popular webinar so far in numbers, obviously very well themed. And we want to make this quite interactive. So for all attendees, what I'm expecting is that you've got uh, something that you can bring to the webinar and maybe just share a minute or two. Um, if you're not prepared with that information, then now might be a, a good time to, to leave. But by the way, it's uh, it's first of April, so you don't actually need to uh, contribute. Just in case you were getting a bit worried there and you left your notes behind. In reality, I'm going to take the first thirty minutes and go through a fairly fast-paced uh, exercise immunology um, presentation, and then I'm going to open the mic. So basically, keep your mic off at the moment, keep your video off at the moment. But then when we open it up, fire in the questions, because there's, there's quite a few, there's 60 of you now. Um, fire in the question through the chat box, and then I'll, I'll ask you to come on and share that, or I can just read out your question. So that's how we'll format it. So I want to just start with my interest in exercise immunology. I'm an ex-runner, uh, middle distance runner. So my interest really stemmed back to when I was 16. and yeah, I had throat infections recurrent through pretty much every uh, winter and can really understand it. I, I look back now and realize, well, I had quite a lot of growing to do into my six foot three frame. Plus I was academically, you know, working really hard. So when, when you bring together the perspective of this presentation, it's not really that uh, surprising. I went on to do my master's degree in North Carolina and met David Neiman, who was from Appalachian State University. And you'll see his name mentioned a few times in this presentation. So I was, I've always been quite inspired to study in this area. But when I got to the end of my master's degree, it was kind of the choice of academia or getting out and applying it to, to people. So at that point, I became probably the most overqualified personal trainer. And I've now had like 25 years of one-on-one -on -one interaction with uh, clients initially through uh, exercise and um, then into nutrition. And now I'd say more into, yeah, all, all of the above. Uh, I wouldn't quite uh, quote myself as, as any particular practitioner. So what I'm not going to be covering this evening is a detailed response to COVID-19. I'm not an expert, but what I am good at is creating a perspective around it. And I'm also not going to give you an in-depth review of exercise immunology. Either of those can be done in half an hour. But what I will focus on is the word contextualize. Let's contextualize the information for a client. So under this host of the Center for Integrative Sports Nutrition, it's mostly practitioners that we're attracting to this forum, webinars, podcasts, etc. So it's about contextualizing all of this information for your client and then personalizing it as well. And then in other words, um, <laughs> I do use a lot as perspective. Let's put it into perspective. Uh, with the COVID-19 is a very good example with everyone scared out of their wits at the moment. But if you can build up a, a bit of education around immunology, then you can put the threat into perspective. So I just want to start with a few newspapers and can you just you know keep an eye on the wording here? Okay, so we get Boris Johnson, um, Talking about battling COVID-19. Here's a South African one. We've got the health minister who's battling COVID-19 as well. All on his own, I think. And then this headline, what does it do to the body? You know, what does that headline infer? What does it 
do to our body, do we not have a choice in what it does to our body? Okay, so from that, I want to jump into this very old German terrain theory. And I wrote a couple of blogs recently about COVID-19 and, and I went back into this. And it's very, very basic and obvious, but a lot of us aren't actually using it, which is why I want to talk about it. Okay, so if you go back about 200 years uh, into France, you had two very prominent uh, medical um, practitioners stroke uh, scientists at the time, Louis Pasteur versus um, Pierre Bichon. And basically they had very different ideologies. Pierre Bichon, sorry, if I, if I pause at all, I'm just letting more people in. Um, Pierre Bichon was the first person to, to discover airborne microbes. And he went, he went on to understand that healthy cells contained living organisms that could evolve into bacteria, but only under healthy conditions. He therefore considered these organisms that were in every one of our cells to be a basic requirement of life, noting that disruption of them could... Uh, could lead to disease. So that was very much, we're in the era now of uh, the microbiome research. That was kind of early microbiome. It's the bugs within us have a synergistic relationship with our health. And yeah, he's very much ahead of his time. But as the story goes, uh, Louis Pasteur stole his, stole his work, um, was claimed to be the first person to discover the airborne microbes. Um, but he didn't really understand the relationship that Bichon did, and he almost demonized the bugs. The bugs are the ones that cause disease, and he was a better marketing guy, so his, uh, his um, let's say, paradigm was the one that stick in, stuck in the era. And unfortunately, it, it still is stuck. So within medicine, we're talking about killing the bugs. So uh, antibiotics, um, we've got the vaccine. So obviously there's, uh, there's a big, a lot of money behind this now. Um, but within the therapy of being a practitioner of nutrition, of health, of exercise, integrative, functional, any of the type of people who will be on tonight, we understand the terrain and we're actually working on the terrain. So that's what we need to focus on. And as you'll see as I go on, we can be kind of lured into the germ or the bug theory and trying to kill the bug. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, this is an important one just to come back, especially for your clients. If you just share this story with your clients right now, when they're scared that they're going to get some illness that's going to kill them, it might help their, uh, their fear slightly. Just going on to more exercise related uh, research. So this is Neil Walsh um, and he's a British exercise immunology researcher. And I think he's done a really good job with this uh, reference paper. By the way, if you see a, a name down at the bottom of any of these slides, you'll find the, the reference right at the end of the presentation, which Simone will share with you tomorrow. So this is a really nice review article that uh, I enjoyed reading. And he's high, highlighted different areas that could influence uh, lowered immunity in athletes. There's too many to cover tonight, but uh, I'm going to try and do some of them. So the first one I'll look at is heavy exercise. Then I'll look at life stress. Then I'll look at nutritional deficits. Or I should say uh, Mike Gleason will uh, consider nutritional deficits. Well, one thing I was going to say is... Um, I'm a bit of a generalist. There's actually people on the line this evening with a huge amount more immunology uh, knowledge than I do. But my job is just to try and pull it together in a cohesive, uh, contextualized way. Okay, so I'm going to bring Mike Gleason in for a few minutes when we get to the nutritional section. And then I'm going to throw in a few others which are just from my practitioner experience, other contributing factors to immunology of an individual. 
Well, maybe start talking about athletes and talk about individuals because athletes are individuals that need to be looked at in a personalized way. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start with the exercise side of things. And this is very much the, the remit of um, Mike Gleason, David Neiman, uh, Neil Walsh. If you're interested in this area, there's a huge amount of information out there. Mike, you'll be pleased that uh, I have this old book of yours, which I've used many a time for a lecture. Um, and also here's his uh, brand new textbook. So there's a lot of good information on immunology in these kind of uh, resources. So I'm gonna start with uh, where everyone starts and that's the history behind uh, exercise immunology. And this is going back to uh, David Neiman, kind of around the time I, I met him, to be honest. And it's based on research that was done in quite extreme um, marathon conditions. So Peters and Bateman, that's a, yeah, that's a famous study looking at the ultra marathon, the two oceans marathon in Cape Town, which I am very, very familiar with because I've helped prep many people for that, and the comrades. Two oceans is 56 Ks, comrades is about 89 Ks. So they're the big, big events. And then Neiman, looked at the Los Angeles Marathon in 1990. And what they were finding was, okay, if you're a lazy slob, uh, you've got above average risk of URTIs, upper, res upper, tract, upper respiratory tract infections. If you're moderately active, that risk then goes down. But then if you're very, very active, like in these cases, these marathon scenarios, your risk goes above that of a sedentary control subject. I've added Gleason in here because he was starting to look at um, carbohydrate feeding, blunting cortisol responses to heavy exercise, and therefore the immune compromise might not go as high, but uh, more on that in a little bit. Then we've got, I just wanted to throw this out. It's not very popular, you don't see it very often, but there's the S-shaped curve as well, um, showing that Here's the J curve up to high, but then with the elite, it theoretically would drop, which is quite interesting because the uh, first time I saw that, I, I said, well, maybe it drops because the elite athletes are, uh, have the time to eat, rest, sleep, um, and do it all again. They don't have jobs uh, and so many um, things that they have to complete in their lives so less life load so that's my theory behind that but interestingly he came up with a, a different reason that elite athletes somehow had a you know state of the art immune system that was very resilient that's interesting and there might be some genetics in there but i haven't seen it written about anywhere else so here's just a couple of studies looking at moderate exercise uh, benefits so we've got uh, Neiman et al. in 1990 looking at a sedentary versus uh, exercising group, improving natural killer cell count. And then Mike Gleason in 99 looking at um, secretory IgA levels being improved with regular exercise. So, you know, I don't think there's any doubting that. And just as I was preparing this uh, presentation, I got this, uh, I'm the editor of FSN magazine, I got this press release, which was just perfect. BBC Radio 5 Live helps keep older audiences fit with short daily workouts. Great, that's what we actually need uh, as one of the contributors to good immunity. I'll go on to why exercise might decrease immune or create com immune compromise. And this is Mike Gleason's uh, diagram from, from the, the latest textbook here, Sports Nutrition. So it pulls it together well. And, you know, I like to think integratively, and this is a really nice um, example of a mechanistic diagram looking at the biochemistry of inflammation. Inflammation is obviously part of the immune response with inflammatory or um, anti-inflammatory cytokines related to exercise, nutrition, or any inputs that you put into the body will have a pro or an anti-inflammatory effect. But 
this is a huge area of um, of work. So that's about it for me this evening, unless somebody wants to discuss inflammation later on. One thing I wanted to just uh, question, uh, Mike, is on the right hand side here, we've got decreased chronic d disease risk. I'm just going to say this. Um, I think that depends, and I'm going to just kind of back that up a wee bit later on. So let's start looking at how we can uh, moderate load. Load is a combination of intensity and volume in exercise. So here's an overtraining paper, really nice overtraining paper, looking at super compensation. So decreased capacity when you've exercised, which kicks up into an adaptive response if you're giving yourself sufficient recovery. But here's the CrossFit model. Um, I'm a big fan of CrossFit. And if there's anyone online, um, sorry, that was sarcasm. If there's anyone online who's a CrossFit instructor and you do follow a periodization program, um, then I thank you. Um, a lot of people are following this pattern now. You know, they're just a progressive drop towards injury or illness. Or what I see in my clinic is a lot just following this baseline. So they're never actually progressing because they're not recovering enough. And you might do five, say, CrossFit high-intensity high interval training sessions in a week. How can you possibly recover from that? You know, I was a semi-elite runner, and three was it. Three big hitting sessions was sufficient. How do you train below the 0% line? So this is one of my favorite, favorite slides, and it goes back uh, a long, long time. But it's basically, basically an observation that for most exercising intensities, you're raising your cortisol levels. So if you follow my cursor, it's above the 0% line. So 60% um, so is pretty easy in, when it comes to endurance exercise. 70, 80 is probably like steady. And then 100% VO2 max, a lot of interval training is done at that. But how many athletes train down here? Not enough. Uh, I see a lot of triathletes, runners, cyclists, and do they tra train under there? Hardly ever. Okay, so there's the magic line. How do we train under there? Okay, and I'm coming to the answer. This is a yin yang representation, which I love. I love the wholeness of this. Chinese medicine's great, there's always equal and opposite. Um, you know, equal opposites, shall we say, to provide a wholeness. Now, I normally present this on a Prezi where you can like zoom in and out. But on the left hand side, this is the ying side. You've got Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates, um, anything restorative and anything, anything with good breathing. And then on the right hand side, here we've got triathlon time trialing, cycling, you've got track racing, you've got CrossFit, you've got, you know, let's say very competitive tennis, powerlifting, sorry, Olympic weightlifting there. If you're doing all that stuff on the yang side, you actually need to do some of the stuff on the ying side. And I'm just blowing up the quotes in the middle. Too much exercise of the wrong type of the wrong of the wrong type at the wrong time will most likely be bad for us. It's a question of balance. And we've got Pete Williams on tonight, and this is his slide, which I think is great. Instead of just, okay, well, I'm going to have an off day or an easy day, uh, I just want run today. He has a huge list of lots of different recuperative strategies that you can use to work on that yin side of the, of the wholeness. Okay, so it's not just good enough to sit, put your feet up and watch TV. Here's a, here's a few good pointers for you. And then I just want to finish this section with uh, this um, paper, which I picked out of Mike Gleason's book. How much is too much? So it's talking about a consensus, IOC consensus statement on load and sport and risk of illness. There is emergence, emerging evidence that indicates that inappropriate load management is a significant risk factor for acute illness and the overtraining syndrome. It sounds obvious, 
it sounds really, really obvious, but we've got a heavy reliance on science to provide the answers these days. So it's, uh, this is important to hear. This is important to say, and we need to actually be looking at load management. That's the first thing I want to do with a client, an athletic client, if, if they come in. Um, but, you know, they've all got these online coaches nowadays and, you know, they're following by the book, you know, what they should be doing and they're monitoring heart rate, but they're not really monitoring the person. And I did that for a while as well, but uh, eventually uh, I gave it up because I actually want to be an old fashioned coach meeting, meeting an athlete at a track a few times a week so I can actually see who, who and how they are doing. Okay. Oh, sorry, this should be uh, should be down. I've um, messed up the uh, annotations. So basically, with the load management, this paper is basically saying with good load management, you can bring down that curve for elite athletes. Okay, so I, I definitely agree with that. And you saw. Let's just go back to that. Oh, here we go. Um, with that curve, I read, I wrote this paper for January in FSN magazine, and it was a bit cardiovascular health. And what I'm seeing in physiology kind of everywhere mirrors this uh, U shape effect. So if you're sedentary, your risk of health imbalance is higher. If you're moderately active, it's good, you know, health prospects are very good. But if you're doing too much for too long, and I uh, looked a lot at like masters athletes who are in their 40s and 50s and still pumping out several marathons every year, which I see here all the time, then you start increasing the risk of health imbalance, stroke dis-ease. I say dis-ease rather than disease, because I, I feel disease is in many cases reversible if you do the right things. And here's a little flowchart thing that I included in the article. Okay, so just uh, immunology around psychology. And we've got a few psychoimmunology uh, experts on the line tonight. And I wanted to start with this total load concept. And we've just talked about load management. Let's talk about load in our life. So we've got three Ps, according to Dr. Alex Concord, who's a P&I specialist in, in England. If you have psychological burden, it pushes down the amount of space you have for physical capabilities and physiological capabilities. If you get physical burden, i.e. I'm training for an Ironman, it pushes the psychological and physiological uh, capabilities as well. Okay, so it's quite, quite important there. And in both cases, the physiological is getting shrunk. The physio physiological capabilities to be healthy are being diminished if your load is too high. And this is a, another diagram from Neil Walsh, where he focuses on exercise and life challenges, stimulating the sympathetic and the, end, the sympathetic nervous system and the uh, neuroendocrine axis to affect immune function in some way. So generally, short-term stress will increase or improve immune uh, ability, but long-term stress, long-term cortisol exposure will tend to bring it down. Think of the chief executive working like crazy to get all the stuff done before holiday while he's got a you know, rough throat, for example. Then he goes on holiday and guess what? Bang, uh, he gets ill. So within psychology, we've had this profile of mood states or POMs used for many years. And this is very much a research tool. It's very hard to find it online, a, a questionnaire for it. Um, but I want to kind of just stretch out into other paradigms. We've got Claudius van Wyk uh, on, the, on the line this evening. And um, he's a very intelligent man. And he brings psychoneuroimmunology into health and even into business. And this is his wellness paradigm or his health disease continuum. And if you look at base state in the middle, 
if you're deviating to the left, oh, gradually moving towards this ease. If you're deviating to the right, good, we're, we're getting towards health. So just remember that. And then I really love this curve of his. Here's zero, the baseline again. And this is an acute day-to-day -day change in health patterns. Okay, so this uh, period of time, this person was prax practicing recuperative strategies in his or her, her life. But this period, they might have been going through heavy training combined with bad eating, stress, uh, fighting with the missus, you know, whatever. And then it's deviating towards disease. That's an acute state. But imagine you're spending more time below the line than above it over years. That's where I see all, all the problems in my clients. And I want to um, bring up another study with Neil Walsh and Jason Edwards here. Um, this is anxiety and psychological stress and the immune response to it. So the findings found that a similar strength relationship for the level of state anxiety prior to exercise and the level of physiological stress during exercise with the in vivo immune response to exercise. That's a massive, massive statement that what we're thinking is uh, potentially equal to what um, the exercise stress that we put ourselves through. So good on you guys, good on you researchers for coming into this um, neuropsychology area. And here's a, a practitioner I, uh, I know quite well. And this is her quote from a newsletter responding to COVID-19. COVID stress and unresolved emotions can totally hijack your immunity by triggering a chronic stress response in the survival part of your brain. And this can get stuck in your body. And moving on to some other psychoneuroimmunology inf information. This is from Joe Dispenza's book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. I haven't quite got there yet, but I'm working on it. But basically what he says is a lot of his work in the survival zone. And we almost become addicted to cortisol. And it, it keeps us in this loop. And I can identify with that. I've uh, trained hard, worked hard, studied hard most of my life. And find health imbalances as a result. So can we break that habit of just survival and start creating health? Just like uh, Claudius's uh, diagram a, a couple of slides ago of going above the line and not below it. Okay, and then going back years ago, I read Deepak Chopra's book, um, Oh, it was one of his earlier ones that will come to me. And it basically I had something in there that just made me up, jump up and go, wow. And it was uh, the fact that neurotransmitter receptors had been identified on white blood cells. So I went looking to see if this is true. And guess what? I found research from the 90s up to the present in journals called Advanced Neuroimmunology and Journal of Neuroimmunology. So this is this is just stepping out of the comfort zone. Instead of just staying within the sports um, journals, we can step out into health journals and we can, oh, thank you, Claudius. So it was a quantum health by Deepak Chopra that I was talking about there. So we can just cross disciplines like I do all the time. We can bring in other information for our clients. Okay, right. Mike Gleason, are you ready? So this is, uh, this is Mike's slide that he sent me through and I thought it'd be better if he said something about that. Um, and this is in the area of nutrition, which I've just kept to his slide and, and, that's, and that's all, even though it's a massive area. Yeah, this is uh, uh, unfortunately a rather complicated slide, but I'm gonna try and keep it relatively simple. Um, most of you will probably think of in terms of nutrition as sort of being able to boost immunity. In fact, we, we hear very much about dietary immunostimulants in the literature and on the internet. And uh, 
there's a new paradigm that actually Neil Walsh has introduced into the field of exercise immunology. And that's that uh, not all nutritional interventions that decrease our resistance, decrease our uh, incidence of infection are actually due to boosting immunity. And in fact, they might be almost doing the opposite in that they're actually improve, improving tolerance to microbes. In other words, they're actually dampening the defense response, but still allowing us to control infection at a non-damaging level. And that's what's shown on the right hand side in the, in, in the green boxes there. But if we start with the left hand box about improving resistance, there's really three ways nutrition can impact on that and decrease infection incidence, uh, at least potentially. One is on the, on the far left there, reverse of any mechanism that's currently inhibiting immune function. So we've heard about before about carbohydrate during exercise being used to inhibit rises in cortisol and adrenaline and therefore uh, remove some of that depression of immunity. Or glutamine supplements to counter the post-exercise fall in glutamine availability, which was some years ago purported to uh, uh, inhibit lymphocyte proliferation. And even things like indirectly that supplements, for example, that could improve sleep because we know poor sleep quality has a negative impact on immunity and on incidence of infection. So that's one way in which nutrients can work. Another is simply to correct a an existing deficiency that might be in vitamin D, for example, that we could correct with a supplement or eating more uh, sources of food rich in vitamin D or getting more sunlight if we can or UV light. And then there's this other idea you get, you know, some sort of stimulation of immune function, usually some one or more aspects of immune function through actions of things like colostrum, which might improve barrier function, particularly in the gut. In the green, we've got this other idea that uh, things could actually work in another way by improving tolerance to, uh, to microbes. So it might be things with direct antimicrobial actions like zinc. Um, it's been shown to be able to inhibit viral adherence and replication. And taking zinc at the onset of a cold, as long as you take more than 75 milligrams a day, is known to reduce cold incidence by an average by uh, or the duration of a cold by about a third. And there are other examples there. And then there's this other idea that you really actually are dampening down immune responsiveness via anti-inflammatory or antioxidant actions, which reduce tissue damage and perhaps allow us to tolerate the presence of microbes more without producing symptoms of actual frank tissue damage and illness. And some examples there are shown the, uh, you know, the, the, the antioxidant vitamins, vitamin C, and vitamin E, vitamin D could work that way. And these essentially reduce the infection burden and would be expected to reduce symptom severity of colds if you have them and or, or the duration of colds rather than necessarily affecting um, incidence of infection, for which there's really very little evidence that many of these supplements actually do do. Most of their actions seem to be to reduce the severity and duration of illness episodes when we do get Hi, Mike. We've lost you. Okay. 
Sorry, Ian, did you hear me okay? Uh, we just, uh, we lost you for a minute there. Oh, sorry. Uh, what, about halfway through? No, it was just the last, uh, maybe the last 30 seconds or so. Okay. Um, I was just saying that perhaps uh, on, on this uh, bit on the, on, the, on the green side of things, that uh, this, is, this is the new idea. Okay, Mike's obviously having some uh, audio stuff. Hello, Mike. Um, Hello. Yeah, you just, uh, you keep going to muted. Right, I'm us Back using up. the space bar to try and keep myself on at the moment. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know if everybody got that, but this is the idea this, uh, that you can actually improve tolerance to microorganisms by essentially dampening defense mechanisms so you don't actually respond the same. Because some of these defense mechanisms, like the inflammation, they actually produce tissue damage. And that's what causes your symptoms you get when you get a cold, when you get your sore throat and that sort of thing. Uh, so by dampening down the immune system rather than actually stimulating it, which is really, you know, the other idea, you're, you're, you're actually achieving the same goal. You're reducing the infection burden on the athlete. They're less likely to develop symptoms. Okay, that's probably Great. all I need to say. Yeah, yeah I'll, thank, I'll thank unmute you, again. Yeah, and if anyone's got questions for Mike when we finish, then uh, please fire them through. So I've got one more section I'm just going to go through, and that's more more sort of practitioner observations from uh, what what I do when I have immune compromised uh, clients. The first thing I want to pick up on is uh, another recent article in the newspaper. Those with autoimmune conditions are falling you know, are more susceptible potentially for the coronavirus risk, which, yes, I would agree with, especially if they're on uh, immune dampening medications. Um, but I'm seeing lots of cases of autoimmunity in serious recreational athletes, kind of mostly within the 30 to 50 age band, but sometimes out, you know, even younger than that. So when I, I kind of queried your slide earlier, Mike, about um, disease risk, I think it's this, this U-shaped curve thing again. If you're pushing it and continuously pushing it for many years, and this is the age band where people are kind of, if they were a serious athlete, they're kind of, they've done their peak. And now they're just keep pushing it as recreational athletes, um, you know, all the big events like marathons, ultra marathons, big cycling events, um, triathlons, especially Ironman. These these events are massive, massive, massive nowadays. And with all the hit training as well, can really, really pressurize the the system. So acute hits, but also these chronic uh, aspects that we need to be considering in our individuals who happen to be athletes. Vitamin D, uh, this is a slide that um, the mic was involved in at Loughborough. And I'm just going through things that I might test for. So I'll definitely look at vitamin D when there's immune compromise. This was an athlete who was actually okay. And in this level, she was probably supplementing because uh, I generally see levels of 20 to 30. Um, and this is nanograms per milliliter, which is what we get in the labs down here in South Africa. Then there's food sensitivities, which is a you know, big whole area on its own. Uh, a lot of doctors don't really believe in that, but I've had some huge transformations just by changing uh, dietary, daily dietary uh, interactions. Okay, so here's a food intolerance. It's another name that gets used with autoimmunity. Oh, sorry, I just zoomed past that. And this uh, picture of one of the IgG tests that I use. So borderline is 30. Here's milk up at 84. So, hey, I'm at least going to try. There's, there's a lot of question around IgG and other forms of food sensitivity testing. 
But if you can correlate the lab information with what you see in practice and you try it and it makes a difference, well, the client's not really going to care too much if the, the science is quite there yet with the information. Then gut bugs. So I've, I've highlighted blastocystis hominis, which is one of the most common parasites that we see in a stool test. And this was quite interesting. It's uh, stress exacerbates infectivity and pathogenicity of that parasite. Now, one of my early exposures was um, when I was studying nutritional therapy, we were sent to a doctor in South London who did live blood analysis. And one of my student friends, uh, he found a blastocystis um, in the blood and um, described how they might use herbs to try and clear it. And he said, but you need to be working on the whole immunity because you can just do these or even take medication and it will mostly clear it, but gradually it will come back. And I didn't really get it to that point, but now I absolutely do. You need to be looking at the whole picture and not just which supplements will take out blastocystis or some other uh, thing. Okay, this is a GI map test. It's a stool test that I use quite a lot when they can afford it. This is actually a, a Crohn's disease patient in his 30s who is a runner, recreational runner. There's blastocystis, well out of range, and calprotectin, his highest level he ever saw was 2000. He sent me a lovely email the other day saying it had been just retested and it was at 19. That was one year of work on dietary and a bit of gentle supplementation. So essentially now his Crohn's disease isn't there anymore. He'd had two resections, bowel resections previously. So you can do a huge amount just with food and we did a lot of stress management as well. And then something that deserves a whole presentation on its own is the gut-based perspective of immunity. And I don't have time to expand into that, but uh, Michael Ash, for those who know him, is an absolute authority in this area. He's in chapter eight of this particular book, which is uh, very nice if you, if you don't have it. I have my copyright here. It's a very functional thinking book. Um, so yeah, if you want more information about that, just Google Mike Ash, gut-based immunity, and you'll find quite a lot. Okay, endocrine balance, very important. This cortisol doesn't look too bad, although the late mornings are a bit on the low side, but the DHEA levels are very low. And this is, uh, this is somebody who's 30 years of age, but he, she has got DHEA levels of a 60 year old. So there's your heavily training athletes with a big burdensome, burden, burdensome lifestyle on top of that. Teeth and toxic metals. So if somebody needs a root canal and there's infection, that's depleting on the immune system. And there's a huge amount of mer 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 mercury amalgams, which can compromise immune function a lot. So it's another thing to look at. Here's our example test of very high mercury. Um, yeah, and very high aluminium as well. And then systemic bugs. Okay, so this is a whole other area. So here's Lyme's disease or Borrelia, which a lot of people believe are causing autoimmunity, chronic fatigue, and, and even long-term death. Um, and yes, it has the potential, I believe, because it's a very hard thing to get rid of and to, to balance. Um, but if you focus on the terrain, as well as the bug, you can actually deal with it. So here's some levels of um, a lady in her 30s, a triathlete who was just overdoing life. She had positives for CMV and Epstein-Barr virus. Borrelia was out of range and Bulhazia, which is common in South Africa, was out of range. It took me two months with some gentle herbs and <laughs> pulling her back off her hectic training program to, to get her energy to come up and her immunity to come up. So fairly basic interventions. And then 
we want to return to the beginning. So there's the virus. This is apparently a swine flu virus, according to Shutterstock. And there's some lymphocytes. So I talked about these two words earlier, contextualize and perspective. When working with athletic clients, we need to personalize the interventions with them and create a context of their life. So Paul Oren, who's online, he did a webinar on the ecosystem theory, where you can actually delve into all aspects of a client's life and see what influences are having on whatever you're looking at, in this case, immunity. It's then your job to put all the information into perspective for them, i.e., well, for example, since you're a young, fit athlete, if you're effect, uh, infected by, with uh, COVID-19, you shouldn't have a risk of you know, being severely ill or of dying. But if you're overtraining, it will slow down the immune response. Eating badly because you've got no time, not sleeping enough. Whoa, okay. It could go from a very mild flu that you push off quickly to something that you get, that gets into your system and it burdens you and you end up needing to uh, be a lot more intensive with the strategies to clear it, okay? So, it's, so it is important. Um, okay, and then with that contextualized information, you can build up a protocol for them, okay? So that's me. Sorry, it took a little bit more than half an hour. I probably tried to put too much in. Here's the reference list. So you'll get these um, slides tomorrow. So you can explore any of those. You can come back and ask questions as well. I just want to mention this is a, a Center of Integrated Sports Nutrition um, hosted webinar. So I'm just going to go th quickly through the prices. Um, we're coming to the end of the early bird. So I've extended that to till midnight on Friday. If anyone who's watching was thinking, mm, or you might be cash strapped because of uh, COVID-19 and uh, want to wait till later. But anyway, that's out there. And there's all of our information. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share. And I'm going to open it to anyone who wants to. And I'm going to start going through some of the questions that uh, have been asked. Okay, does anyone want to jump on at the moment? Pete, Paul, Mike, Claudius, Simone, feel free to just un unmute. Ian, good evening. Hello, Paul. Paul. Um, I can take a quick sprint through a couple of things that I've been looking at. I don't want to spend a great deal of time, obviously. And um, so if I can just hit one or two things that we've spoken about that I've discussed with you and I've also discussed with Pete on yep. occasions. Um, looking at the probiotics, first of all, which we mentioned the other day, and the gut-lung connection. Um, as I say, just a very quick run through that. As I understand it, the virus that we're talking about at the moment, um, attacks lung tissue and then multiplies from there. The inflammation response that we've been talking about, that is triggered and we get a huge immunity cascade. That gives bacterial pathogens a chance to actually infect and potentially lead into organ failure. Interestingly enough, some of the research says that some COVID-19 patients have presented with GI issues as well. Now, the link between the gut and the lungs, I think, has been well established over some years with various papers. And I think that the link with probiotics and immunity has, again, been pretty well established. But from what it seems, the research is saying, the research exists to actually say that some probiotic strains can reduce allergic reaction, can help athletic recovery. They can help prevent this pro-inflammatory cascade. Um, there's been a reduction of lung tumours, albeit in rodents, and they have the ability to, me uh, to mediate flu-like 
respiratory tract infections. However, from this particular outbreak, there's been no direct research that I can find on probiotics and COVID-19. I don't know whether anyone else knows of any. I couldn't find any. But interestingly, it was apparently recommended as a treatment by the Chinese National Health Commission for severe cases of the virus. And I think what they were probably working on is that there's no real potential downside. And But there was no recommendations either of any particular strains. So I think we're in a position there that the research is very early to know what's actually sort of happening. Um, there was a 2011 paper, and just to quote very quickly a piece from that, probiotics exert different levels of immune response in a host-dependent manner, including gene expression, protein synthesis, signaling pathways, and in, um, in immune cells, and intestinal epithelial cells. So in other words, what will work for one person certainly won't work for another. So I think we're in very interesting times. There's at least one supplement company um, that has already got out um, an immune response, not particularly related to COVID, but they have got out um, an immune booster, which already includes certain uh, lactobacillus strains. So it's still early days for that. So that's as far as what I've got on there. And I'll just take a very brief look at, we've, we've spoken about exercise, and I think modality of exercise is interesting as well. And I think that we need to look at not only, because when we talk about exercise, the immediate reaction is cardio-based exercise. I think we do need to look at resistance training as well there, for all sorts of different reasons. And I would aim for the functional type movements. So you've got things like squat patterns, lunge patterns, push, pull, hinge, overhead work, et cetera, et cetera. And from a number of different reasons, whether it's immunity, whether it's um, sarcopenia, um, and even the exercise response that you actually get through the immune system and the cytokine response, I think that's very well worth looking at. And the last point that I would like to make, in, if you don't mind, I know that I've cracked on at great length about the science is great, but don't forget the client. I think this is very important, and you did make that point a little bit earlier, now, I distinctly remember when I was going through an extremely stressful time when my father was dying some years ago, and I found that having some of the hardest, heaviest workouts that I had actually helped me. Now, I think it was probably one pain chasing out another, and I would agree that I don't think I could have kept that up for any long period of time. But in short, controlled bursts, I think that it can work, and I think it's just another important area of know your client. So, as I say, that's just a very quick sprint through, Ian, I'm just covering a few little bits and pieces. I hope that's okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, I would say that you, during that time, you probably had enough adrenal reserve to be able to push push through and not uh, be too compromised. But you, as you say, know your clients. If you get somebody who's already, you know, really struggling health-wise, energy-wise, immune-wise, injury-wise, yeah, there might be a, a time to turn to something like yoga, tai chi, something that's energetically just trying to help them uh, deal with the, you know, the loss in their life. But yeah, bereavement's a massive one. And uh, Patricia Warby that I mentioned earlier is uh, a real expert in that area. Um, okay, I'm going to read out uh, Joy's, Joy's uh, question. Do you really believe we can boost the immune sy system? Surely we just support it. Has anyone got a response to that? Joy, were you picking up on my uh, lazy use of words? Nobody. 
Um, can you boost it? Um, boost is probably the wrong word, um, but you can certainly extend the immune capacities, um, if that's the same thing. Who's online? Just jumped in, mate. All right, mate. <coughs> Go, Pete. This is Pete Williams. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's a question of uh, it's a question of antics the words we use. Can we be because I suppose what was what Mike discussed before that actually sometimes we just want the immune system to be more tolerant. And I sort of uh, tell the story of about, in many ways, you want your immune system to be like the old experienced bouncer outside the nightclub. He's been and seen lots and lots of years. Although 18-year-old kids who've had a bit too much drink and messing around, messing around less experienced sort of do the wrong thing, whereas a sort of more experienced bouncer at that there may be troublemakers, but has a resilience and a, a history of about how, how to control them. So if we were talking about uh, immunity, I don't want to get to enhance into immunity, but I think the beauty of exercise does is that it's brilliant at, if you like, priming immunity. You know, I suppose the key is what, what do we tell our patients? Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not really dealing with athletes, I'm dealing with um, the, the chronically disease like. I just say basically that exercise is a fantastic way that we can help that our immune systems. So our immune system becomes sensitive to the fact that your blood getting pumped around your body allows that immune system to, 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 to allows the blood and the to push cells to more places. But when we get to do that, actually we get things where they become better secure and it's in better places. And what exercise seems to do is prime those soldiers because our immune system is like your defense force, it's your army, it's your um, army, navy, and the earth. Well, again, we just get to, we get what exercise allows that immune system to do is a lot of training. Um, you know, it's essentially like it, it's becoming better and better at being able to do its job. And so I just wanted to just quote a look back. And this is looking at middle-aged women. It was looking at a popular group, a, a, a similar group, but they were brisk walkers. I'm talking about walkers. We're talking about it's, um, which is a near-day moderate activity. And what that study showed that it, within the brisk walkers, and again, we can talk about X intensity, there is up to 50% reduction of upper respiratory tract infections. And so when you look from that, from that study was that there is nothing in medication, there is nothing in supplementation or any other act of health or um, that beats that. So I think there's a real indication of power movement. And I think this really takes back to what are humans and what are humans trying to do? And that fundamentally, we don't work very well, work very well when we're not applying some degree of movement to the daily. And so seeing through the sense is that it gets strength, it gets better, it gets more sensitized, it's more capable of doing its job correctly, and it can be. But what is clear is. We have to make sure that we're doing the exercise consistently. So if I'm talking to my chronic populations, whether it's autoimmunity, whether it's a question of something trumps pretty much most, most of anything that we can give you, intervention strategy, but you've got to be consistent with it. So exercise primes the immune system, it gives it training, and then allows it to do its job so that's I try to tell the story to the patient. Thanks, Pete. And uh, I love the analogy of police and army and air force and so on. Um, I think that explains the immune system really well. Um, and I've heard Mike Ash and I mentioned Alex Concord earlier talk about immune tolerance, which you, you said there, Pete. And it's not 
so much trying to boost your immune system. It's uh, finding the balance in it. And if we had time, we could go into, you know, deeper into the immunity and start talking about Th1 and Th2 balances and autoimmunity and allergies and, and the various theories around that. So it's, uh, I view it like a seesaw, you know, the immune system. Yeah, I think, like I think I know if I'm, am I still on? Yeah, you're on. Sorry, so I think they're really, um, and this immune tolerance, I think of one studies this was the NEAT study, NT, and this was done at St. Thomas's um, probably about four or five years ago now, and this was looking at um, infants with severe peanut and over, I think, a period of 18 months, they were basically for that period give the um, infants with very severe peanut allergies tiny amount of the allergy of the pea. Over time, what they're doing theory about using this is that because the immune system was consistently seeing the peanut allergy, it started to develop tolerance. And I think that's one of the um, certainly the more more theories as Michael to for about it's not someone the immune system to respond. There's some arguments with regards to certainly COVID to do want the system to be completely tolerant um, want it to be hyper responsive and I'm, I'm not sure the version on I think this is going back to what Paul talked about is that I don't think we're, because it's not been around long enough for us to do clear and conclusive studies with it I think what has what has come out um, and um, I did a quick look uh, the uh, respiratory um, medicine correspondence and I think some of the some of the population groups that are potentially going to be from what we're learning from China is um, the population group, the type two, type two diabetics, because it seems that the virus attaches to the angiovertin enzyme uh, is preferably expressed in the in the uh, endothelial cells of the, the lungs, but also we need and in the kidney and the vessel so that's definitely one of one of the potential popular at-risk pop groups that we're going to need to think about thanks pete um i'm going to ask catherine if she's around uh, so she was talking about um oh, let me find your Predisposition of endurance athletes to URTI is an impact of training stress on the gut and secretory IgA, I think places them potentially in a higher risk uh, category for COVID. What are your thoughts? Um, and then you supplied another paper. So I'm not looking at the paper at the moment, but yeah, I think it's just as Paul and Pete have said, know your, know your client. And this U-shaped curve that we've seen all evening, if somebody's in the middle there, great. They, they, they can be quite resilient in most cases. But if you've got, so Catherine, you're a triathlete, so you're dealing with people like I am who are really pushing the boundaries. I mean, I thought one sport was enough, but uh, three together is a huge uh, ordeal on the body. So yeah, if you've got really somebody pushing the boundaries and uh, the cortisol levels and DHEA is uh, suppressed and energy is suppressed and they're getting up too early and compromising their sleep, they don't have enough time to eat properly. Yes, absolutely. I think they're a higher risk um, for COVID. It's more likely, as I said earlier, just it will get in but not pushed out quickly enough. You don't... Um, you can't raise antibodies quickly enough because your immune system's compromised. And then it kind of gets in. And we've all had that experience of the, you know, it's just a regular cold that you think will go in a couple of days, but a week later you're tra traipsing to the doctor to try and get some antibiotics. So not me, I haven't done that for many, many years, but uh, you, you, you follow my argument in terms of, you don't want it to get in to place and, and stay there. You want to get the immunity strong enough before the exposure. Um, all right, I'm going to read a, a teeth. Uh, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. 
I'm a pharmacist in the UK. It seems to me that viral overload, i.e. constant intake of the virus, seems to be taking people out. Like HIV patients who need numerous antiviral drugs to keep the virus at a low level. Additionally, people's diets are shocking, hence they have a low immune system in general, hence causing many other diseases because of a lack of antioxidants in the body. So thanks, I think you summed that really nicely. And the key thing is uh, people's diets in general are shocking. And um, I hope we get some follow-up studies from COVID-19 with regards to who has been affected worse. Um, I saw initial data from China and it was very much elderly plus cardiovascular patients, diabetes patients, uh, upper respiratory like asthma sufferers um, that were having the worst issues. Here in South Africa, we're on complete lockdown because they're paranoid that if it gets into the townships, it's going to take out the HIV and the TB patients. So. Yeah, it's very much, again, that inverted U, sorry, the, the U shape. Where are you on that curve? And if you are immune compromised, there's plenty to share. You know, there's some real basics. Um, Paul, Paul Loren kindly did a nice um, position statement for us um, on, the, on the website. So if you haven't been on our website for a bit, visit and you've got some, some basics there. And... Yeah, I mean, the, the basics are quite easy to, to go through. So that is the average person, the average British person or Italian person or Chinese person or South African person. Let's coach them to better health behaviors. And as Pete says, for those people, regular exercise is really important. Um, but we need to know the patient. Um, if they're the overachieving triathlete, who's also a a banker working 12 hours a day yeah they're on the other scale they need to pull back okay let me see if i've got any others um okay melanie gardner thank you melanie bant don't like us to say boost so yeah sorry that i obviously uh, slipped uh, that slipped out of my tongue uh, earlier i presume so let's say modulate i like the the phrase modulate Okay, Vicky Smith. Hi, Vicky. How do we manage athletes back out of the lockdown period? You say that we can manage load to decrease injury and illness uh, risk. The load drop came with no warning when when matches. She she's in football. How do we manage them back uh, out of this period? Was somebody going to come on there? Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just reading back through. It's fair to say when match is finished. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hi Vicky. Hi, um, yeah, I, I work in football. Um, I've got a large group who um, I probably won't have access to when we have lockdown mission. I wonder if there was any advice on managing the load as we come back out. Um, we obviously had this huge drop um, that came without warning. Um, and how do we kind of manage them back out of that? And is there any advice from managing a large group to try and avoid illnesses coming and providing further problems for us? Anyone want to provide an answer? Um, I'll, I'll make a start. You know, the you, you don't want a massive drop and then a massive lift. That's probably the worst thing you can do. So. Um, Definitely, if you're not doing so already, they should be doing as much as possible at home to, you know, they might not be on the pitch, but uh, they can be still working on the strength and conditioning and going for rounds or bike sessions or whatever to keep the, keep the general load uh, not too much lower than before. And then when they come out of the, the lockdown period, um, just like, you know, pretend they've come out of off season and wean them on, uh, wean them up to the, the standard load. And, and hopefully the fixtures will be adapted accordingly uh, to give footballers a chance to, to wean back into fitness again. Um, because that's another thing that can compromise immunity is going from a low, low base and then suddenly they're, they're training at a high level again. 
Yeah, definitely. Okay. Anyone else want to add? Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, Vicky. Pete, thanks for uh, telling us about the Facebook Live tomorrow. So you can see in your chat box, uh, there's a link to that. 7 p.m. Okay, we've got Naomi. Um, I think this will be the last one we can take. Um, okay, as a child, I was always encouraged to be outside in free time or when playing sport. Is there a possibility that we no longer have the tolerance to certain microbes because we spend more time indoors, either working or training, and therefore we have not created a memory for this to be able to defend ourselves against the COVID? Whoa, that's a loaded really question. Good question. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Pete, do you want to go? Yeah, I think there's. I think there's definitely some relevance in that. Um, we uh, we. Our practice, we, we, we do a significant amount, certainly microbiome testing and research. And I think it's the first that what we see, unfortunately, is, is um, with microbial diversity cause the, and that many reasons. But uh, I firmly believe that one of those reasons are because we spend enough time outside. Um, and so, yeah. I think that uh, I think that's a brilliantly um, worded question. I absolutely believe that that's the case. We see it all the time. I do believe this is one of the one of the mechanisms where we see. I suppose um, talking about humans is that it's more bacteria in numbers than we are human cells, and so those bacterial numbers are dependent on our bacteria that we carry around interacting with all the other bacteria. Fortunately, this comes back to the question about people, person, planet, because our soils are deficient. We don't microbes at all. Uh, and I uh, so agree to pretty much everything that you said. We believe the mechanisms that we see. Uh, and I, I think what is happening with regards to um, what I was talking about before is that the microbial diversity of gut is poor and poor in, in most people. And when you lose microbial diversity, the flexibility of a system to be able to deal with the stresses and strains of what grows at it. And, and the mechanism among humans and health is that once you start the ability and the diversity to deal with trauma, then you're, you're, on the, you're on the path, unfortunately, to diseases and disorders. So yeah, good, great question. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Okay, I've got three more questions. I'm gonna just s summarize. Um, one's about um, COVID-19 is a novel antigen, so we can't have immunity without exposure or you know vaccination, and that's another whole topic. Um, so the social distancing and so on. Uh, somebody. All right, P. I'm just going to meet, mute you quickly. Um, so all the all the strategies that the governments are using at the moment are important, but Claudius shared a shared a slide the other day when I watched his webinar, and it was a massive big peak. I think it was in red, and then in blue it was a, a smaller, more prolonged peak, and that's what the governments are trying to do we will probably get exposed to it at some time. We can't really avoid it. Like uh, swine flu was in 2009, 2010. I've seen cases in recent years, um, not that I'm dealing with it personally, but uh, I'm seeing it, people that have had recent exposure to it, it's still doing its rounds, as are all of these things. So many of us will be exposed to it. So it's not about avoiding it. It's not about having gloves and we're not gonna walk around in, um, in a mask and gloves for the rest of our lives. So it's about reducing, sorry, improving our immune ability to deal with it when we're exposed to it. We're exposed to novel things all the time. And with that question, I'm just gonna take you straight back to the, the germ and the terrain. There's nothing you can do about the germ. Yes, we're reducing the, the speed of um, it going around at the moment, but
but if and when you do get exposed to it, it's about the terrain's ability to deal with it. How are those neutrophils, how are those natural killer cells doing? And are you able to build up that antigenic response to it quickly? And just, you know, even very simple things like we've got an innate immune system and an adaptive immune system. The innate, one of the innate immune system uh, things, the most important ones is stomach acidity. So if it's coming in through the gut, stomach acid will, will kill most things. That's one of its roles. So if you're gut compromised, if you've got hypochloridia, whoa, okay, right. There's uh, past the first hurdle next, uh, along to the next one. So the best thing to work on is the terrain. And then we've got some discussion about high heat. Yes, we, um, I mentioned before about Bulhazia, Borrelia, um, what else? Um, oh, these normally come off the top of my head. There's a few kind of quite invasive um, pathogenic organisms that you don't really want sitting with you, like that triathlete lady who had couple of viruses um, and Borrelia and Bulhazia, which in some people could cause big problems, but two months later, she was looking great again. What was different? We improved her food. We, we brought down her exercise into that moderate range, and she, we focused on stress management and sleep. So we're focusing on the terrain, whereas somebody else with the same infections, co-infections, we call it, as she did, can gradually go down and okay there's the autoimmunity there's the chronic fatigue there's yeah there's quite a horrible life coming coming along so yes we've got the strategies and we've got this uh, amazing homeopathic doctor here in Joburg who does all these strategies these massive herbal protocols he does ozone therapy he does uh, far infrared sauna to try and heat heat the bug um, and it's all part of uh, special treatments and I've been through all of these things. I've looked at the heavy metal stuff. I've looked at the bugs. I've looked at all these, um, these very specialized non-standard medical treatments. And they can help, but sometimes they, they can really lower the immunity because they're quite harsh. So I've been on these multiple herbal protocols plus the sauna every single night, plus the ozone therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes you can actually compromise the terrain trying to kill the bug. All right, I hope that makes sense. So you need to be looking at both. Um, okay, Catherine, we're talking about uh, ACE2 inhibitors. Um, so for example, licorice. Um, but we can't recommend that under band. Um, okay, so licorice tea. Right, so last question, last question, and then we need to, I think, wrap it up for this evening. Uh, so licorice, okay, so it's an ACE2 inhibitor, so that's to do with blood pressure. So licorice is a contraindicated herb within hypertension cases. And that's the kind of official line and, and people working under regulatory bodies have to kind of follow official lines. But if your herbalist is very, very tuned into the use of herbs and the energetics of the patient, they will, won't really listen to regulation. They will kind of use what they feel fits for that person. So something like licorice, yeah, it can be used in certain cases, but you need to know what you're doing. And I'd, I'd prefer a herbalist, an experienced herbalist to start using the different strategies around, um, you know, try to kill off viruses and so on. The basics are the most powerful. Like Pete said, regular exercise most days of the week, getting outside, being exposed to different pathogenic organisms, um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Eating well, you know, we are eating so well at the moment because we're stuck in the house. So all we can do is buy in stuff and uh, and cook, and uh, that's great. So I'm not afraid of COVID-19 when it comes, 
because yeah, I'm exercising in the garden, I'm keeping that stuff going, getting to bed early, doing my meditation apps, you know, all that good stuff. So that's the stuff we can control. So my closing words are, as a practitioner, as a client, as anyone working on your own health, focus on the, the basics that you can control. And that is most of the battle. Then we've got the specialized strategies to kill off viruses and other um, pathogens, but they are exactly that, they are specialized. So only do that if you have somebody who can advise you appropriately and who can do it personalized for you. Okay, good night guys. It's been the longest webinar I've ever done because the, the questions have just kept coming in. So it's been great. Um, please, uh, you've got our Facebook, you've got Twitter, you've got our website, so fire over emails. Any questions, uh, just let us know and we can, we can continue the discussion. Um, and Simone will send these slides over tomorrow so you can have a, a browse through. Okay. Good night, everyone, and uh, thanks again for joining.